I think the concept of understanding that most rich people are most millionaires, they get that way by spending far less than they earn and investing the difference in whatever it is they choose to invest in. And I think that's probably the most important concept. Somebody who earns $2 million a year isn't necessarily rich. I met a guy who earned $8 million a year who had very little money. Thank you for coming on, Andrew. Welcome to the Rebound Talks. Thank, thanks very much for inviting me, Antonio. It's been a crazy couple of days. I'm curious to know what your opinion is about Reddit pushing the GameStop stocks. And now we're seeing trading platforms like Robinhood not letting their investors purchase any more of these stocks. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I mean, first of all, for me, this is, this is one of those things where uh, investors really need to think more long term. And there are always going to be games that are played with markets and with what people are going to do in terms of speculating. And I think one of the best things to do is to recognize that we really ought to stay out of speculation completely. The idea is that we build a diversified portfolio. If we're truly greedy, if we truly are greedy, <laughs> to me, the definition of true greed is to maximize the overall profits, not to make a ton of money this week or this year and then potentially lose it all the next week. So what, what you're seeing right now with a lot of tech companies is you're seeing a lot of things that were happening in the late 1990s. You're seeing mass popularity almost a euphoric kind of popularity for businesses with great stories, but those businesses don't have strong earnings to support them. So long-term, here's what we know. Here's what we know. We know that long-term, a stock price will appreciate in conjunction with its actual business profits. When that doesn't happen, there's always a really painful reckoning. And so, yeah, there are all sorts of games being played over the last couple of days in terms of different stocks that are going going really high, going crazy. We've got hedge fund managers who are trying to short them and we have other people trying to buy them. It's burning the hedge fund managers. I think the best thing for us to do is ignore all of that. Don't get into speculating and buying stocks that don't really have any earnings anyway. The best way to beat 90% of the investment professionals over your lifetime is to build a globally diversified portfolio of low cost index funds. Don't speculate add money every single month or whenever you have the money and rebalance as needed once a year back to your standard original allocation. So you will beat, you will beat almost every day trader and professional speculator and professional investor and professional hedge fund manager over your lifetime through this process. So it's ignoring the noise du jour. And it's easier said than done. I would love to for you to tell us about your story and how you realize this nine principles that you talk about in your book, The Millionaire Teacher. And I know one of them is conquering the enemy in the mirror, ignoring all these noise. But it's not, as I said in the beginning, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a emotionally we're not emotionally wired to be good investors and and i think it has to do with the fact that humans and i say humans when i say that um and and ironically men more so than women women you can give women a set of rules and, and they tend to be a little bit better at following those rules and i know this is the fascinating thing when it comes to the man woman concept too where if you give financial literacy tests to men and women men typically have more interest in finance. So they typically score a little bit higher just when you give these tests to the general population. But all kinds of studies have shown that women are actually tend to be better investors than men. And so Fidelity did a study, Wells Fargo did a study, Vanguard did a study, um, Karen Sodian and Brad Barber, a couple of uh, economic professors did a study. And it's so consistent. So now back to that original question about the difficulties. I think it's, it's the belief that that we or someone we know can see the future. And for some reason, men more often than women end up falling for this. And whether it's a level of a higher level of testosterone, a higher level of belief that somehow we can beat the system. Um, it's also men that drive really typically crazy fast on freeways as well. Men take higher risks. 
And as a result of all that, and when it comes to our finances, it can ensure that, uh, that typically we, we end up underperforming. But again, back to that premise, it is so hard to harness that, to recognize that, hang on, in all sorts of other pursuits of life, pursuits in life, the more you put into something, the better you end up. So if it's, if it's in the gym and you want to get stronger, <clears throat> the more time you put into thinking about the workouts that you need to do, reading about the workouts you need to do, and then spending the time in the gym actually doing it, well, that will increase your likelihood of getting bigger and getting stronger. And it's much the same with any skill-based sport or activity, uh, learning to play the piano or the violin. Investing is one of those really weird things. It is a really weird, there's a paradox with investing because putting less into the effort actually ends up with higher returns for you as the investor. So when Fidelity did a study, they wanted to see, well, which were its best investors? Were they people that had PhDs in economics or at least master's degrees in business? And how old were they? And what was their gender? Well, they found that the best investors were typically either dead or they'd forgotten they had accounts with Fidelity. <laughs> so it's that ability to go, you know what? I'm not going to spend any time watching the markets or listening to the news or chasing any kind of fad, which could be... Uh, give me great high returns during one period and then big, big crashes the next. If I truly want to maximize the probability of long-term success as an investor and to maximize my wealth, because that's really what it's all about, right? It's not necessarily having lots of wealth next year or maybe having lots of wealth next year and then losing it the next. It's like looking at the statistical probabilities, the academically irrefutable probabilities of maximizing your wealth. And in doing that, it's so simple you just essentially build a low-cost portfolio of diversified index funds or ETFs, continue to add money, uh, don't chase fads, and, uh, and decade after decade, you'll beat the vast majority of professionals. So it's been so interesting as an investor for me over the last 31 years, watching, this has happened before. Um, in the late 90s, this happened, where we had stocks price crazy levels uh, far, far above the, the warranted business earnings. We had much the same thing happening in the 1960s. So this was before I was born, but I was fortunate enough to read a little bit about this. It was much the same. People said, well, this time it's different. Their new electronic stocks are going to change the way businesses run. And it did change the way business was run. But much like today and much like in the late 1990s, when stock prices rise far faster than the business earnings of those companies, there ends up being a, uh, a, a painful reckoning that occurs. So instead of chasing hot things, Putting our egos aside and building that diversified portfolio of index funds will give us the best odds of success. Statistically, it's just proven. And for example, I want to know if you, God hopes not, is kind of morbid the question that I'm going to ask you, but let's say you were to die in a week. What investment portfolio would you set up so that your family doesn't have to look at it and they'll be set for life, basically? Yeah, well, it's such a great question because any of us could be dead in a week. It could be dead <laughs> tomorrow. Um, and that's why you have to live live for today with an eye on tomorrow. But again, really quite simply, that diversified portfolio of low-cost index funds really would be the best way to go. You've got a guy like Warren Buffett. Uh, he's 90 years old. He knows that uh, that at any time he could kick the bucket. And so for him, his wife's several years younger than him. And so they have an estate. And he's recognized that, wait, hang on a second. If my retirement account, when I'm no longer around, is going to be under my wife's name, I want to make sure that it beats just about all the hedge fund managers and all the college endowment fund managers and all of the fancy traders and the asset allocation managers. That want, I want to make sure that my wife's money, or Buffett wants to make sure his wife's money beats most of them, right? And so he knows and has access to institutional money managers that we don't have access to. He has access to and he knows hedge fund managers that we, we just don't have access to. But despite knowing all that, he realizes that the odds are best going with, this, with, a, with a diversified portfolio of index funds for his wife. So in his estate, that's what he's actually instructed. Hmm. That, that's, that's great. But let's say you're graduating now you have piled up a bunch of student loan debt so do you recommend they just 
put a little bit like a hundred bucks every month, 200 bucks into this diversified portfolio of index funds? Or what do you recommend they do having this amount of debt right when they graduate? Yeah, that's an awesome question because what you'll have is with your student loan debt, I think often we're looking at what I'll call it's high interest debt is what it is. It's usually, you know, above 5% per year. And in today's climate, 6% loan, you could call that in today's climate anyway, a high interest debt loan. So when you go to pay that off, when you put money towards that, let's say it is a 6% loan. Do you guys have student loans at all? No, uh, uh, us, no. Thankfully, we don't. Yeah, that's good. I think (laughs) think a a pretty common range, I was talking to somebody um, recently who had student loan debts and they were talking about the 6, 6.5% range. Wow. For, you know, there was different, there were different interest rates for different, some of it was a bit lower, some of it was a little bit higher than that, but overall, uh, she seemed to be paying around 6%. When she pays that off, or she aggressively works to pay that off, it's equivalent to an after tax guaranteed return of six, six and a half percent. So nobody can really guarantee you a return of six, six and a half percent, whether you're investing in the stock market after taxes as a guarantee. But this is a guarantee. And so it's fairly prudent to attack the student loans if you have one. But like to your point, Antonio, really good point um, is about that investment concept where if you have established some kind of habit, and I like the fact that you, you know, you mentioned small sums like say $100 a month. It's just that habit that you can establish. So, okay, they're tackling that student loan debt. They're slashing away at it, trying to crush it. At the same time, having that account open and they're contributing money to a diversified portfolio of index funds is actually a pretty good thing because once they've crushed the debt, they just start to take more money and put that more money back into their investments. So they've already started that habit of investing that small sum. On the other side, when you're looking at something like a 401k plan, and this is really, really important, if your employer is going to offer you free money up to a certain point or up to a certain percentage of your salary. It's best to, no matter how big your student loan is, maximize that first because that's really important. That's free money. So if you're willing to invest $5,000 a year and your employer is willing to chip in an extra five grand, giving you essentially a 100% one-year return, that's fabulous. So, So what I suggest to students is take advantage of the free money by maximizing any kind of matching 401k contribution plan and attack that student loan and take it down. How did you realize all of this? How did your story with compound interest come to be? Because you came from very humble beginnings. How did this enlightenment enlightenment come about? I was... I had to pay for my own college and I had a job working at a, at a bus depot in the summer. And the guys I worked with, they were, they're all older than me, guys in the thirties, forties, fifties. I was 19 years old at the time. And one of them said to me, Hey, there's this one particular mechanic. And if he ever wants to talk to you about money, you make sure you listen to him. And so I thought, well, why would I, why would I listen to a mechanic um, about money? And here I'm 19 and, you know, as most 19 year olds are, I figured I knew more than I did about life in general. And I just thought it was impossible that that this guy would have any wisdom to share. And then this other fellow said to me, no, no, no. And he looked at me and he was so serious. These were guys were never serious with me. They were always like kicking me in the ass, you know, and, and joking around and they were, they were, they were goofballs. But this he took really seriously. It was totally uncharacteristic. And he said, no, if this guy ever wants to talk to you about money, he's a self-made millionaire on a mechanic's salary, you better listen to him. And one day, this millionaire mechanic did start talking to me about something non-work related. And so I just soaked it up. He talked to me about the power of compound interest. He said, look, you want to be a school teacher. And I know school teachers don't make a lot of money. So here's what you really need to do. You need to get your money working for you so that you work less hard for money. And because I was young, um, the fact that money can compound so dramatically over time indicated that if I started investing early, 
I would have to, or I would be able to invest far less money over my lifetime than say somebody else my age. If they hadn't started investing then, I could invest far less and I could have so much more in the end. So this really appealed to the to my lazy side. Um, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all over it. It, it. In the beginning too, he even asked me like, he said like, could you do $100? Now he said to me, you just start doing $100 a month. I said, I, I can't afford that. Like I've got a student loan. And actually that's interesting because Antonio, that's basically the sum that you brought up and said, what if you have a student loan? And, and I did, I d did have at that point, I did have a small student loan. And uh, and he said, a hundred dollars a month, you got to do it. And I said, well, I can't, you know, I can't really afford that. So he said, look, if 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 you went over to that vending machine, could you theoretically buy like a muffin and a can of Coke out of that vending machine every day? And I said, well, I guess so. And he's like, do the math. You know, that's almost a hundred dollars a month right there. I think he might have mentioned like two cans of Coke and a muffin or something, and they were like whatever, a dollar a dollar a piece or something like that. Like, oh yeah, I guess so. So uh, that started me on that journey. So I started to invest when I was 19. And you went to pretty extremes. You went to crazy extremes in order to really invest when you were young. I would love for you to expand on that. Yeah, when I saw how powerful uh, compounding worked and when I saw how, how much money I could amass over time by starting to invest early, I went crazy i went completely crazy for it i absolutely loved the challenge it, it sounds like i had a really miserable life in the in the in my early 20s when i started working professionally but i loved every aspect of it i'm not recommending it i think you have to be wired you have to be wired a certain way but i loved this challenge so for example um when i first started working professionally i would look for places to house sit And I figured, wow, if I could find somebody who was taking off for six months and I could look after their cat and stay in their home, then I wouldn't have to pay rent for that six month period. So I wouldn't need my own apartment. I could just go from house sitting gig to house sitting gig. And the money that I would normally be putting away in, towards rent, I'd be putting into my investment portfolio. So, so I did that. Um, and then eventually I wanted like my own place. And there was a, but I wanted something that was cheap and okay. And so the best place, the best cheap place I could find was 55 kilometers. So that's like 30, 33 miles away from where I worked. And I had a little Volkswagen, a Volkswagen Rabbit at the time. And I remember thinking, okay, so this rent was pretty cheap. It was $350 a month. And so, and that included heat, that included television, the whole bit. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Three, $350 a month. Of course, you know, this was back in the, in the earlier 90s. So, um, <laughs> I, I took this job and realized, man, if I drove to work though, I'd be using up like fuel in that process. Like I'm, I'd be driving over 60 miles a day. So I got this ingenious idea <laughs> to, to, to get a, a mountain bike. I had a mountain bike and I put like slicks on it. So I took the knobby tires off it. I had a trailer. I towed it. I took, put the trailer under the back of it and I would ride to work towing this trailer with my clothes and whatever student essays that I would happen to be grading. So I was riding my bike like over 60 miles a day, over 30 miles each way to work. Um, and I didn't have laundry facility at the, uh, at the place that I was living at. That was the one thing that wasn't included. And I didn't want to be putting like coins in the, you know, like the laundromats, putting quarters in. And so I'm thinking, how can I get around this? So, so I became pretty good friends with the home economics teacher at the middle school that I was working at. And she said to me, Hey, Andrew, you know, you get in, you get in pretty early. She says, why don't you just use the laundry machines here at school? So every Friday I'd stuff all my dirty clothes in a, in a big plastic bag. And, uh, and there was a ton of dirty clothes. Could you imagine like, obviously each day I've got like, I'm back and forth. And so I'm sweaty. There was a shower at work, which was great. Um, And anyway, I would compile, I'd get these big bags, this big, huge garbage bag of clothes, and I'd ride to that garbage bag, you know, tow that down the highway, throw that in the washing machine at work, wash the clothes, dry the clothes. And then before I started teaching, I had them all nicely folded up back in the bag. <laughs> I, don't I don't recommend that, but, uh, but it was, it, uh, maybe I'm, I've got a screw loose somewhere, but I actually enjoyed that process and that challenge. 
<laughs> wow. Well, and this allowed you to become a millionaire at early 30s, right? It accelerated the process for sure. I was late 30s. So I was, and I don't know, it's funny, I was probably 36 or 37. And it wasn't even a really big thing at the time. It wasn't something that, um, that I thought about, like it wasn't a specific date where I went, woohoo, you know, there's a million dollars in the account. Um, on the first day that it hit a million dollars, I, I didn't really even think so much about that. Yeah, you just kept doing what you were doing, investing in this diversified index funds, and uh, and it paid yeah. off. That and how do you think that? Yeah, and it's, and it's go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was I was going to say that along the way, um, a lot of my friends would try to take shortcuts, follow hot funds, follow hot stocks, uh, and they might do better than me for two or three or four years, but eventually I ended up catching them. So it's why it, it's one of those things where it's it, in, in when it comes to amassing money, it's the uh, it's the tourist that wins the race instead of the hare or the person attempting to be the hare. How do you keep this patience throughout this whole time? Because you see your friends making all this money, you see the news every day with a bunch of catastrophes that are about to happen. How do you keep your mind clear and have this patience? to wait 10, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, however long it might be? Um, yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, and, and I've often wondered that. For me, one of the things is, is I actually don't follow the stock market. So I don't, uh, I don't open my account. Um, even, even today, if you asked me, like, what's your portfolio worth? Um, it's worth several million. Uh, and I'm 50 years old today, so it's uh, it's it's more than enough for me to be financially independent. And so you'd think somebody in my place would be really interested in watching the stock market and watching how his portfolio performed. Um, if you said to me, like Andrew, what's it actually worth? How much is it actually worth? I probably most days, if I had to really work hard to try and guess, I probably couldn't even get within. Two hundred thousand dollars of the correct answer, and 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 it's just because I don't look, I don't look, and that I think is a key is just to separate yourself from it and focus on the more important things, because we know that statistically speaking, all the academic evidence in the world suggests that we just do this thing over and over and continue to add money in a diversified portfolio. We know that we'll beat ninety percent of professional investors. Okay, so that's done and dusted. That's automatic now. That's out of the way. Now I can focus on other cool things. I can focus on exercise, my friends, my family, doing cool stuff, um, learning new skills, and having fun in life. Yeah. And ego and FOMO, I feel like, are the two biggest uh, impediments to achieving this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And that's why it's best to just put that out, put that out of your mind. Um, and I think that the, the process of FOMO or the concept of FOMO when it comes to material acquisitions is, a, is another really big challenge. That's probably the bigger challenge. It's, you know, your neighbor buys a new car and it, you might work in the same place. You earn the same amount of money and your neighbor has a new Tesla and you're driving like a 12-year-old Honda Civic and you're feeling like a bit of a schmuck. And thinking, well, wow, wouldn't that be nice to actually have that? Uh, and so it does take perhaps an unusual personality not to fall for that. It takes that moment, I think, where you need to take some deep breaths and try to figure out what's really important in life. And, uh, and in recent years, I've been really fascinated to look at studies on happiness and to see that material acquisitions don't actually increase our levels of happiness at all. It's the relationships that we have with other people. And it's, you know, it's getting, it's getting sleep. It's having great friendships. It's having, um, it's having good connections with others. That's, that's the bottom line. So when we buy something new, there's like a, a process called hedonic adaptability that kicks in. At first, we're excited, right? So we buy the brand new whatever, the iPhone 12, right? So we're super excited. Wow, I've got my new iPhone. But it doesn't take very long, Antonio, where you get to a point where that's just a phone. Like it's just the thing that it's the same thing as your iPhone seven, your iPhone six. It, it, it's just it's just utility, and it's much the same with cars. 
you know, we think, wow, the, that guy with a brand new car, the Porsche or whatever, the, the, the brand new Tesla, he must really enjoy that driving experience more than you would enjoy driving your 12 year old uh, Honda Civic or whatever it is, that, you know, you might end up owning. Uh, but that's actually not the case. It's like at first, the person with the new car is kind of excited about it. But then after a while, they're not really thinking so much of the car when they go, when they move from place to place. The car just becomes a tool. There are other things in their mind, like, am I late? You know, that fight that they have with their girlfriend or boyfriend or, um, you know, how things are going at work with a specific colleague. And so as a result of that, our minds go off the actual driving experience itself. So really cool Michigan State University study showed that um, the actual driving experience, when people, when it was assessed as to whether people actually enjoyed driving more with a high profile or a high status car versus a, a low status car, it ended up being completely nullified. There was no difference between how somebody felt when they drive based on hedonic adaptability. So knowing that, so knowing that is kind of an exciting thing because when you understand the science behind it, you go, okay, I'm not going to get sucked into this. I get this. Now, instead of spending this money on a depreciating asset like a car or a new fancy handbag, um, if I could invest this money for the future, this can buy me the only non-renewable resource that we truly have, and that's our time. So we could be dead next week. But what's, what's beautiful about the realities of life is that if, Antonio, if you choose to at age, how old are you now, actually? I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm 22. So you're 22. So what's really exciting for you is that at age 30, if you decide, I'm going to take a year off, I'm going to travel the world at age 30, and you've set yourself up for a degree of early, earlier financial independence, you have the option of doing that. You have the option of purchasing time. It's not necessarily extending your life, but it's extending your life experience. So it might as well be the same thing. And I think you did that yourself, right? You have a book about uh, how to make money as an expat. How, how was that experience like? Well, for me, it was, uh, I took a year off and so I was 32 and I decided that I was going to travel the world and I did that and then ended up with a job at the end. I didn't come back to my original job, even though it was cool because I was working for a school district that would allow me to take that leave and then come back to the original position. And so after about 11 months of traveling and really enjoying that, I ended up getting this, a job at uh, an international school in Singapore. And that in itself was an amazing experience because I was working with students. Uh, the school itself represented uh, about 55 different uh, nationalities among the student body. And it was much the same with the teachers. Most of them were Americans, but it was also a really eclectic mix of colleagues. And so we just all shared passion for education what we were doing but also that passion for travel that passion for life that passion for for taking in different cultures and different people and then as an expatriate um, some of the rules of investing are a little bit different in terms of where and how you can do it what brokerages you can use and what products are available and many of the expats got 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 ripped off by really horrific um, financial service salesmen, like really, really bad, far, far worse than, than most of what we typically see in the United States or Canada. And so the, the book that I wrote, Millionaire Expat, was really about how do you protect yourself from these sharks and snakes? Um, I have a, a, the fourth chapter in that book was actually titled, um, Don't Let a Fool or a Psychopath Wreck Your Future. So uh, I had some fun with that, but I also feel that um, my hope is that, I, that, it, that it, served, uh, it served a good purpose for people as a helpful resource. And how do these psychopaths wreck your future? Is it through fees or how, how do they do it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's such a good question, Antonio. Their, their level of fees are so high. They're absolutely outrageous. So I'm, I'm going to give you an example, and it's going to sound even hard to believe, but if, if, if somebody moves overseas and they're contacted by a financial advisor, here's how the, the, the system will typically work. The advisor will say to them, okay, so you're earning whatever. It's usually pretty decent money. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, 
let's see if you can invest, say, $2,000 a month. Let's just say they could do that. And so the client signs up, yep, $2,000 a month. So what's that, like whatever, $25,000, $26,000 a year. And uh, my, my math is wrong on that, isn't it? $24,000 $24, $24, $24. a year. <laughs> Twenty-four. thank you, thank you. The advisor, if they signed you up to invest that $24,000 a year, the advisor would get an upfront commission of about $27,000 upfront. So it doesn't seem like it makes any sense, does it? No. What, what, what do they get that commission, commission 27 for? Grand. So they would get the they would get that commission for essentially getting someone else to sign their soul to the devil. So <laughs> here's how it works. If I sold one of these policies to you, if I sold you one of these policies, okay, Antonio, two thousand dollars a month. Yeah, we're good to go. I'd get about a twenty-seven thousand dollar commission. I'd split that with my brokerage, so I might get like uh, I get about sixty percent of that, and then the brokerage gets the forty percent. But now you're in a contract for twenty-five years. You will pay investment fees of about four and a half percent a year for twenty-five years, and if you try to pull out after one year, the company will take all of the money you pulled out, you don't get any of it. It'll be a penalty to you, all of it. So you, at the end of one year, you've invested 24 grand. So Antonio, you call them up, you say, hey, I've got a better way to invest this. I wanna put it in a portfolio of index funds. And you'll say, can I please have my $24,000 back? They'll say, no, sorry, there's an early redemption penalty. And uh, you lose 100% of what you put in it. Even if you were in this thing for 10 years, Antonio, even if you were in it for 10 years and you tried to pull your money out, and let's say at that point you had, I don't know, $200,000 on the statement, it says you have $200,000, you're in for 10 years, they might smack you with a $100,000 penalty for pulling the money out before a 25 year term. So one of the reasons is that they paid the upfront salesperson so much money in an upfront commission, that they need to keep your money with the firm as long as possible to bleed you over time. So if they can ensure that you pay 4.5% a year in fees over a 25-year period, they more than make up for what they've given the, the financial salesperson. So these products, fortunately, we don't see them. Uh, <laughs> we don't see these typical structures in the United States, which is a really good thing. But once we move abroad, it's a, it's a, whole, it's a whole snake and lizard show. <laughs> I'm curious to know how many, like what percentage of financial managers make their money of fees like this one? Like, how do you know if your financial advisor has your best interest at heart? The, the best thing that you do is if you want a financial advisor is to ensure that the financial advisor builds you a portfolio of low cost index funds or ETFs and only builds you a portfolio of low cost index funds or ETFs. That's it. When you sit down with a financial advisor, you could actually trick them in one sense by saying, well, what do you envision for next year? Tell me where you think the markets are going to go. We know that no one knows where the markets are going to go. There are loads of people who try to pretend, but they don't know. So, and our memories are really short. Steve Forbes said this, you know, he says, we count on short memories in the magazine industry. We have all kinds of people pr promoting some kinds of forecasts. And, and Warren Buffett himself said that uh, stock market forecasters, the only reason they exist is to make fortune tellers look good. So you'll want a financial advisor, if you choose one, who gets you only into a portfolio of low-cost index funds uh, and does not speculate. So gets you into a, an allocation that suits your profile for risk. And, and doesn't mess with that. So it doesn't try and chase, hey, the, we think Korean stocks are going to do well, or we think emerging markets are going to do well. We're going to push your money more towards that. As soon as you get into to a situation where your financial advisor is telling you these kinds of things, you're actually dealing more with a speculator who really just wants to take money from you in terms of fees. Because hmm. the, the riskier the investment, the higher the fees for them, for sure, no? Can be. Yes, it can be. Hmm. That's great. And that's incredible how a mechanic taught you all of this. Then did you go and read a bunch <laughs> of books about it? <laughs> like it's, it's yeah. incredible.
so he got me going. He just got me interested in it. And, and then I ended up working at the same time. Um, I was going to university, so that job at the bus depot was in the summer. And then I did some different jobs while I was in university during the school year. So I was working at a supermarket. There was a, a guy down on a, an area called Beach Drive, which is the uplands area of Victoria, British Columbia. And it's where some really, really wealthy people lived. And I happened to get this part-time job working for this guy. Like I'd mow his lawn. I'd wash his car every Saturday. I just basically did errands around his house for three or four years while I was going to college. And he was a, a dean of the Faculty of Commerce at University of British Columbia. Before that, he worked at Oxford as an economics professor. And we would sit down and we would have these like coffee time sessions. And he would ask me all kinds of you know questions just about life and, uh, and made me generally feel fairly inept. <laughs> It made me feel as stupid as I was. And uh, and he asked me at one stage, he asked me, how uh, are you investing money yet? And I, I was probably 20 at the time, and I was really proud. I said, yeah, 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 I'm investing money. And he said, tell me, how are you investing? And I said, well, I've got a financial advisor with uh, this company called Investors Group, and I've got into a, a bunch of really good funds. And he just shook his head, and uh, he said, no. No, that's not how you do it. And uh, he actually had a copy. I think it was a first edition of Burton Malkiel's book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And he ended up giving me a copy of this uh, to, to read. And then stacks of academic papers that he expected. I, I don't know how he expected that I'd be interested in reading this stuff. But I went home with a stack of stuff. <laughs> I came back the next week and I didn't read, I didn't read much of it at all. But he, he made me feel a little bit ashamed and he started to give me a few, a few ideas, just some things to start thinking about, um, the efficient market theory being one of them. And so the essence that if you build a diversified portfolio of indexes, you'll beat most hedge funds. You'll beat most college and doubt funds. You'll beat most professional traders over your lifetime. So it was that that really sparked it for me, Antonio, because I started reading more then. So by the time I was in my mid-30s, I think I'd read more than 400 uh, personal finance and investing books. So I became um, I became a real zealot for them. I just just devoured as much information as I could about investing. And the more I read, the more these concepts solidified the uh, the approach that that he had suggested I do way back when I was just twenty years old. And out of all those books, which one do you like the most? Hmm, that's a super question. I think I, I'm going to go out and probably say, although it may not be the most entertaining read, that original uh, Random Walk Down Wall Street. Now, Burton Malkiel is amazing, and he I think he's in his 13th edition of that book now. So every five years or so, he ends up updating it. And that book is classic. And so um, he actually wrote that book before the first index fund was even available as a retail product to investors. It, so that first edition in 1975 said, hey, if we, if we actually produce something like an index fund, here's what would happen. You know, you, here, and here's why you'd beat the vast majority of professional traders. So, yeah, I would, I would really recommend that because the book also gives you a really strong sense of, of history. So I know a lot of books have been written and they're kind of flip and they can be kind of fun. That book has a really great sense of history. It gives readers a really good, solid foundation. And so when I wrote my book, Millionaire Teacher, I tried to include the same things that he did in a condensed version that had some humor and that also had like a narrative component where I was explaining some of these crazy pieces of, of, uh, of my personal journey. And in your personal journey from the nine principles, which one's the one that stuck with you the most? Mm, probably living living below my means. So in, I think the concept of understanding that most rich people or most millionaires, they get that way by spending far less than they earn and investing the difference in whatever it is they choose to invest in. And I think that's probably the most important concept. Somebody who earns $2 million a year isn't necessarily rich. I met a guy who earned $8 million a year. 
who had very little money. And <laughs> no way. Eight million a year. Yeah. Yeah, he had very little money. And and he had like, you know, he had a, a big you know, a house on the Riviera and he had like fancy cars and he had Rolex watch and he had all this stuff. But if you liquidated everything and then paid off his debts and took away his job, the guy couldn't live very long. I mean, just a, a, just a, literally a handful of months. So he had enough money to sustain himself for just a handful of months. Um, to me, that's someone who is, uh, who is actually poor. They're not rich. They just look rich. And I think um, another influential book for me was, was Thomas, Thomas Stanley's work, where he said, here's really what millionaires like to drive. You know, so the idea that millionaires love Audis and Mercedes Benzes and Ferraris, some of them do, but most of them don't. <laughs> most of them drive just typical cars like Toyotas and Hondas and Fords. Um, and the interesting thing is most of the high status cars that you see on the road are not actually driven by rich people. So when I, when I read those studies, holy smokes, Antonio, that was so powerful to me to think that, wow, so most of the high status cars I see on the road are not driven by rich people? No, they're not. <laughs> they're not. Most of them are driven by people with really high salaries, right? So they might be lawyers and doctors, people with really high salaries, but they're people without a lot of wealth, generally speaking. And again, it doesn't mean that there aren't rich people that love to drive high status cars. There are, but most rich people don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't buy buy your way to wealth basically that's the moral of the story i feel exactly and something that also strikes me from this stories is that if you don't have the patience if you make the money and spend it right away it doesn't matter how much you make you're never going to be rich exactly exactly wow This has been very enlightening, Andrew. Is there anything you want to say or anything you want to promote? Oh, I think that, uh, I think just recognizing, I guess if I were to promote one thing above anything else, it's just to recognize to me what I think is a true essence of success. And that's, that's boiling down to the relationships that we have with other people. And so If we can master our money rather than have money master us, it frees up more time for us to spend time nurturing the relationships we have with others. If we become the sort of people that don't pursue materialistic things, and instead of pursuing materialistic things, we pursue nurturing the friendships that we have with people, with ourselves, uh, friendships with ourselves, friendships with our families, this stuff's golden. Um, we're all terminally ill right? Every one of us. And we don't know when we're going to die. No one does. So I think, I guess if I were to end with anything, it's just that do your best to live for the day with an eye on tomorrow. 